Hello. Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined by my colleague Lillian Corral. How's it going, um, Lillian? Good. How are you? Good. So good. what's happening? What's happening in LA? Um, nothing much. I think the, the, what is it? The big story is whether our schools will open or not. Although we already yeah. said our schools are not opening, but um, I think a lot of just parents trying to enjoy yeah. the summer and, but also try to figure out what to do with their kids. How about you all? That's, that's the same here. And, and, um, and so, um, you know, there's, there, there's been a, a huge debate in Florida um, around, around schools opening, um, uh, our governor um, giving the green light there, but, but then, you know, there are cities, including where I am in Miami, where there's a huge outbreak and, um, and there's questions around whether or not to open and actually um, one of the unions is, is suing about this. So, so yeah. it's just, it's, you know, there's a lot of questions. I know a lot of our audience members are, are dealing with this um with child care but uh but yeah yep. it's 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 a challenge for sure yeah well so what's going on today in, in today's shows Lily yeah so so for coast to coast um today so it's episode 10 which is hard to believe I can't believe that that we've um that we've had 10 episodes um and and as you know it's it's been such a dynamic time um we've explored public spaces we've explored um topics around mobility around equity um and and it's definitely been an interesting ride um today we will be going um deeper into um, public spaces and really how communities um, rebuild their public spaces in an equitable, inclusive way. Um, in, in particular, um, we're going to be looking at how history and culture and the arts um, play a role in the future of urban spaces um, while building community. Um, so so I, I think it, it's going to be an intersection of actually a lot of the conversations that we've been having. Um, yep. The equity piece, the arts piece, the culture piece. Um, and so it, it, it should should be um, it should be interesting anything that you want to particularly get out of this conversation um, well I'm curious to learn more because I'm not um, uh, I, I love Walter's background and um, I'm not as familiar with um, landscape architecture and the design space um, but I but the thing I'm interested in coming from a policy space is sort of like how you manage for a lot of these sort of policy issues that are in some ways like baked into um, the ways our cities are built when you're looking at design and equity um, and the history of place. So I'd be curious to see how he manages for all that and um, yep. and the kinds of partnerships that he that that he, that are developed in order to kind of help make his that's vision a, come to life. So that's a great point. Um, super. So we can we can dive into that. And so it's my, it's my great honor to um, mm -hmm. welcome welcome our guest Walter Hood. Um, and and for for our audience members, Walter is a world renowned landscape architect um, and artist, a Knight Public Spaces Fellow, a MacArthur Genius Fellow, and the creative director and founder of Hood Design Studio. Welcome, Walter. How are you? I'm fine. How are you guys, Lillian and Lily? <laughs> Hard to say, Lillian and Lily. Yeah. I know it's it's definitely it's definitely a little confusing, and and I'm in Miami, Lillian's in in California, you're in California, so so we we have all the, all of the United States uh, represented here. But but thanks for awesome. being here. Um, no problem. And, and excited to, to have this conversation. And, and I'll just tell our audience about how this is going to work. Um, we're going to have 15 minutes um, between you and me. Um, we'll do rapid fire questions, do some context setting. And then Lillian's going to hop in and, and elevate some of the questions that we're hearing from our audience. Um, so audience members, please put in your questions in the Q&A box. You're going to see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on Facebook um, and streaming on Facebook, um, hashtag night live we can get your questions there um and and let's do it let's do it walter okay um so so i want to start off um with some context setting and 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 um and defining some of the the concepts that that you you speak about um and so one is around hybrid landscapes um really kind of the dualities um in public realm um can you tell us a bit about what this means um uh, give us some context around that and and why this work um is is really important right now well, um, this idea of hybrid landscapes, I guess I've been thinking about it probably for a little bit more than a decade, and it became clear to me by working in the public realm that 
you know, we were still dealing with these historic colonial typologies and no one was really talking about them. And so through a kind of a linguistics framework, I came upon this way of thinking about typologies through this notion of hybridity, right? And hybridity can be defined as, you know, kind of forging two different things together mm -hmm. to become one thing, or it could also be the, the opposite. But I was more interested in this idea of a formal hybrid where you could look at a space and really think about its cultural context and then through a kind of a transgressive way talk about that history. Mm. And so my early projects in plazas and squares, you know, we were really trying to talk about that history through design mm -hmm. and by showing people that things were designed a certain way to control them. Right hmm. through social reform, you know, that if you put in pathways, people would walk along a pathway versus if you left a space open, people might do what they want to do. And in most cases, we tend not to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part are informal hybrids, which I'm more interested in, which is breaking away from kind of colonial ideas and really thinking about landscape or space in terms of trying to invent new ways to think about them. And this could be through language because culture actually does that. So people refer to places through their experiences. Mm -hmm. And so if you begin to kind of build on those things, like we have a project called a solar strand or green print, that we literally take the language to take us to a different place. And so instead of, again, only designing parks and plazas, we're mm -hmm. actually trying to think of place in a completely different way. Fascinating. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, let, let's uh, link to um, an article about, um, about more, so you can gather more information around landscape architecture. I mean, excuse me, um, around hybrid um, landscape. Um, and that's really, really fascinating, Walter. I would love to, to kind of ground this idea a bit more um, around what you're talking about, kind of um, informal um hybrid like w w t tell me uh, actually uh, tell me a bit more about the project that you just spoke about um what is that what does that mean you know different places so we're not talking about a plaza we're not talking about you know what is that what does that mean on the ground it really means to sort of approach a project almost on face value the project i was referring to is in buffalo okay. uh, and we want a competition to do a solar array and it was on a mm -hmm. campus and instead of, again, thinking about the space as already, how can I say, already having a typology, it wasn't a park, it wasn't a garden, it wasn't a yeah. field. We basically did the research and found that there was once a creek that went through and mm -hmm. the creek was moved. So in a way, it was a floodplain. Mm. And so by at least looking at that history, we were able to understand, well, why the water wasn't draining, why the trees were mm -hmm. not growing, and so we try to build a new strand, which are these linear ecologies that follow normally waterways. Mm -hmm. And so by using that, again, that language of landscape, we were able to create an informal hybrid that actually talked about its place and what the space was doing versus a cultural typology. Right. 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 And so it's not then controlled by any kind of idea of a bureaucracy mm -hmm. or any kind of social control of it. It's actually created itself. So it actually comes out of its place and it comes out of the cultural relationships, which was on a campus, students using it, mm. right, providing power for dormitories. Mm. Um, and over time, what happened to this space by working that way, it actually became a wildlife preserve. So by, again, and that was not something that we designed, we actually allowed that landscape to become. Mm. And so these informal hybrids, you don't really know where they end up. You actually try to build a system and allow it to become. And it becomes based on its context, how mm. people are using it. So in a way, it's, it's much more true, right, yeah. to the actual landscape and people. Mm. That's really fascinating. And so, so we're, we're getting beyond being confined by, by the typology that, that you're referring to. Um, and, and one of the conversations that, that we've had is, um, well, well two parts. So, so one thing that, I, that I've noticed is, is, is you, you don't say diversity. You talk about differences. Um, and, and then the second piece um, that we've talked about is how this plays out in neighborhoods and how that's really, we've been, we've been seeing like the local piece um, really interesting around COVID. And, and you and I talked about what this means for 
um, neighborhood streets um, and, and things like that. So, so let, let's explore that a bit. Um, what, what, what are you seeing and learning? <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Well, going back to the first question, this idea of diversity versus difference. Again, if you kind of work down to it, we're always trying to make difference into sameness. Yeah. Right. This is, you know, the country, you know, pluribus unum. We're always trying to like come up with this one thing, and in a way, one thing can't define us. Mm. Uh, and this notion of difference then suggests that, you know, there we have to have this belief in that difference is good. In ecology, yeah. difference is good. And so this notion of trying to make everything the same is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And we kind of saw this, we see it in our politic in this country, and we forget that we're only like 50 plus years of trying to live together in an integrated way. And so this notion then of, you know, trying to make everyone become the same thing, I think what you're beginning to see is this kind of breaking and that mm -hmm. people actually want to be defined on their own to mm -hmm. a certain degree. And I think we're in a generation where, people can't look back because they don't have those experiences. So people, I mean, I was born, you know, before 68. So I was actually born in a segregated society, right. right? People who were not born in a segregated society, they don't have any idea what that means. And so again, they want to be defined on their own. And so what you're beginning to see, I think, is this kind of breaking, right? Mm -hmm. Again, really trying to find ways in which we, can be different, but also build on those differences. And mm. things that we talked about during the pandemic was, you know, my big thing now is, you know, why can't we improve our neighborhoods and show the differences in these places in which, yeah. you know, now I've had to like be in one space for three months and I'm actually seeing how little we invest, right, in our neighborhoods where I can, you know, drive three miles away and see where all that investment is going. But yeah. now being able to sort of see, you know, garbage pickup, you know, lack of trees, you know, uh, garbage dumping, you know, all of these things that make our neighborhoods unhealthy, you know, all of a sudden these things are becoming highly visible. Hmm. That's I right. On everything. No, no, no. You, you, you touched upon it all. Um, and, and I love the way that you, that you speak about differences. Um, and I also I also really love the way that you're thinking about about hyper local um, investments um, and and how there's that possibility of of going more in that that direction. Um, so I want to I want to um, build upon that idea and talk a bit about um, community engagement and and how how you think about that um, with your work because you're 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 talking a lot about um, embracing differences. You're talking a lot about um, about culture, um, acknowledging history. Um, so what role does, does community engagement play with this work? Oh, it's everything. Um, I mean, I don't think I could design a community without having, you know, mm -hmm. that input, you mm -hmm. know, and I don't mean just people saying this is what I want, but having those voices, no matter how different they are. Uh, and it's been interested, you know, in the last three months trying to, you know, build community, you know, the way we're distanced right now, we've set up a model where we formulated, you know, different committees. We have a kind of a small committee and a big committee. Yeah. And an example is we're working in Winston-Salem right now, um, looking at the role of a free black slave, Peter Oliver, who became a ceramicist. And, you know, they found the site next to I-40. And so we have a committee of about 30 people, including the Oliver family, people in Salem, people in Winston, where we have a call every other week and we mm -hmm. get this conversation. And then the next week we have the designers. And so we have this kind of dynamic conversation that allows for multiple voices to be heard, but people to be part of the process so that they feel empowered mm -hmm. right, all the way, not just at the end, but at the beginning. And we allow people to give input and that input then is built into the project. So mm. it's not just part of process. I'm hoping in most of my projects that people who participate, they actually see their voice in the final thing. Mm. Uh, and it's not a, you know, we don't do the ABC, you know, scheme A, scheme B, scheme C. You know, we really believe that through this process of, 
hybridity, merging all of these things, we can actually get something very different in the end. Mm. And so we like to think when I say we, my studio, that we have no two projects in our portfolio are alike. Uh, and, and again, that can be kind of confining because, you know, people always ask, so what do you specialize in? Yeah. You know, and you don't, we don't have this, you know, we do just do parks. We just do streetscapes. You know, we work on landscapes. We work mm -hmm. on the space. And how do you know when it, when it works? Like Walter, like what, what does success look like to you? Success is, you know, being able to go back to a project and actually see that it's fulfilling some of the goals that you set out to be. Mm. Lafayette Square Park in downtown Oakland, we had this idea where we wanted, you know, as one of my friends said, the suits to be with the normal guys and the guys yeah. were, you know, guys who just hung out. And maybe the suits are not there, but the guys are still there 20 years later. And again, you know, these are people who might be out of work. These are people who are on hard times, but at least they have a public space that they can mm -hmm. be. In. Mm -hmm. And um, another project is a project, you know, 25 years ago, we planted 150 trees over three blocks. Huh. At least 100 of those trees are still there 20 years later. So that to me is success. You know, yeah. it's not, you know, whether it wins awards or these kinds of things, it's that the basic DNA that we try to bring to a project, that it somehow has a power to sustain itself. Yeah. And the aesthetic of places are going to change. And unfortunately, in the public realm, you know, cities don't spend as much money maintaining things, you know, and things do get a little rugged. And as a designer, you have, I think in public space, you have to sort of be okay with things becoming a little messy. Mm -hmm. um, like one of our projects, Splash Pad Park here in Oakland, which is a market, which gets a lot of use on Saturdays. It's kind of showing at the edges, but it's still this space that people can go to. It's, it's a fantastic space. Um, so so my, my last question, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call in Lillian because I, I see tons and tons of questions coming in, um, is around um, moving forward, the, re the rebuild. And, and one of the things that you and I talked about, Walter, was, was the, the, the COVID, but then also the racial reckoning that's, that's occurring in our country and, and, um, and how and I don't want to misquote you, but, but you said to me, you know, that, that you, you feel like there's a level of openness um, that, you've, that you've seen um, across the country that, that may really impact the way that we think about our public spaces. Can you, can you talk a bit about that and, and what, you, what you think could occur moving forward? Well, I mean, we were discussing, I, was, I think I was saying, you know, projects that I worked on maybe a year ago or two years mm -hmm. ago, you know, in places people would say, we're not ready. Yeah. We're not ready for that yet. And this would just be simple acknowledgement, right, mm -hmm. of segregation practices or even racial practices. And I think today there is, you know, based on, you know, what has transpired over the last 90 days, there is this moment, I think, where, where we're able, people might be listening now, right? Okay. And when people are listening, then it's time to act. Right, because we only have these moments every now and then. And so, you know, we're really trying to be um, almost going overboard to a certain degree because this is a moment where we yeah. can talk about these injustices that we kind of see around us. And maybe hopefully people will have more empathy now. Uh, and that once we come out of this, hopefully there we have garnered this power to move forward, mm -hmm. to do things that maybe we just didn't do before. That's right. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call in Lillian, um, and and we will we'll talk in ten minutes. Thanks, Walter. Hopefully, these won't uh, be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go really hard on you, Walter. Um, actually, these are kind of hard, and there's a ton of questions. So let's see how, how we can get through these. Um, first, there's a set of questions, um, sort of building on the point that you made about. Um, language and hybridity. And I want to start with the first one around, do you think that it, um, that the, that language of hybridity actually translates into other languages? And can you talk about that? Um, and uh, I, I thought it was a good question just because you're working in a lot of communities or you work in, in communities that I'm reading that are very diverse and we are such a diverse country. Um, and so how does, yeah, how does, and then there's another related question around how language and form um, the relationship that they have in your work. So let's start there. Well, that's a, that's a tough question. But, you know, again, if you are looking to places 
and you understand their difference, one wants to sort of build on that. And I just remember years ago working in San Jose and San Jose was building Paseos. And I was like, what's a Paseo? <laughs> and, you know, they were inspired by their Latino, you know, population and they built these alleys. And then years yep. later, I heard someone use Paseo as a way to take a walk. See. And so yep. this, this notion then of language, how culture adapts through how, through our action, you know, landscapes can begin to build on that. But we also want to understand that it becomes pastiche once you remove culture. So if you don't have people who Paseo in Paseos, Paseos don't work. And that's one of the things that, you know, started me thinking then, you know, you can't just appropriate these things. You have to look, right, to see how people are actually using space and then you can reinforce that. So you reinforce yeah. culture through the language that people are actually using to describe what it is they do. That's yeah, I really, no, it makes total sense. And I love the way that you described earlier how the space sort of match, like allowing the space to naturally evolve into what it really wants to be. Um, we, I, I feel like sometimes we forget we live on land that yeah. actually is meant to be something else. Um, so a related question, um, Walter, I came up is that when you have, um, when you have these differences, when you call in multiple voices, is there a way to bring those differences into convergence? Like, where do we find um, a common approach in some ways or, yeah, to, in order for this all to function? Well, I guess I'm, I'm not looking for the common approach. I'm actually looking for the double negative. I'm looking for those things that can actually reside side by side. That's the difference. You know, to me, you know, again, instead of trying to mold and mesh things to become one thing, I guess I've been more interested lately in seeing how these things can reside together, right? Which means that, again, it's a careful crafting of, it's almost like bringing two people <laughs> together who have nothing in common, right? And bringing them together in a space and allowing them to get to know each other. Right. And I have this kind of belief in the same in spaces that you can make spaces that don't seem resolved. That mm -hmm. might allow people to see something else in them versus resolving them to only have one narrative. Yeah. Um, there's a related question about a project in Los Angeles, which um, struck me because I actually live nearby in Baldwin Hills and um, and it, the question is around the challenge of converting these industrial spaces. So I think you're, you're sort of speaking to it. How do you let these differences really? And, and, and just can you speak to how, um, how you, what are those challenges to converting the industrial space so that it becomes something helpful and beautiful in a community? Um, and, and then perhaps, you know, kind of um, going back to the community engagement piece, there's a lot of questions in the Q&A about, um, not just how do we make sure that we're not just including people in the process, but like in the actual decisions and that they see they have some stake in the decision making? Well, that's a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Well, the first one, you know, in the post industrial landscape, you know, which we are in a post industrial world. And so we do have a lot of sites around. And one of the things, again, that our studio practice has been looking at is a lot of these landscapes are where black and brown people live, right? We have this history of redlining in this country where we're basically have put people in these spaces. And I do think it's time now to be truthful about it. I think, I think the, the knowledge is out there. It's not something that we're just now uncovering. And going back to Lily's uh, question prior to this, maybe to me post COVID, that's something that, you know, a lot of us, when I say designers, that we're looking at these places and how do we actually begin to say, we've disinvested in these places way too long. If we invest, the first thing we have to do is invest in the healthiness of the places, not yeah. just building them. And that should be the first layer. And this can happen in some places through allowing successional landscapes to actually you know, build, which means again, that it's a different aesthetic in the way we might think of landscapes. Um, another would be, again, bringing people into the fold to actually be more, um, how can I say, overt in talking about the health of places, you know, that people living next to freeways. Like right now yeah. we're doing a project with a nonprofit and uh, we're asking people who are basically waiting 
in a food line under a freeway to tell us about you know, what they want that space to be since they want to be in it. And we're actually doing it through Streetwise, which is this digital platform. And so we're trying to figure out ways to, again, get people who are in those landscapes, right, to tell us you know, how they want those landscapes to change or how those landscapes are actually affecting them, which again is a different set of questions that we're asking. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I was, I was curious about that and uh, you may have heard, there's a question here about how do we address sort of the regulatory systems that kind of restrict a lot of these differences. And, and yeah, to me, it seems like, um, and the point about the freeways is a really, is a, is a, is a good one here. I, living in Los Angeles, a lot of our communities are, are designed alongside these very unhealthy spaces. Or if you think about other communities that are over um, polluted water, um, how does that, I mean, how do you account for that in your work? And, and can you talk a little bit about the, the partnerships that you develop to address some of those like policy or regulatory issues um, that are, you know, we can make a space beautiful, but that could still be harming the community that's living in there? Well, that's a really tough question. I mean, uh, you know, we've worked with state agencies, you know, here in California, we have Caltrans, <laughs> you know, we have BART, you know, and a lot of these regulatory agencies, it's really hard to penetrate them to do what I call the work that's going to allow those neighborhoods to actually be healthy. Uh, you know, years ago, we tried to insert a filter system under a freeway with Caltrans. And the big issue with Caltrans was, if there's an earthquake, we need to see the cracks. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, if there's an earthquake, maybe that's the least of your issues that you're having. Yeah. But most of the days, why can't? You know, we have this filter that's actually cleaning the air because school kids are actually walking under this freeway. And we have not been successful you know, and getting people to kind of think in those terms. And I do think, you know, again, I think we need more voices out there to begin to challenge, right, these assumptions that, you know, these things are hands off, right? Because when you think of the, this infrastructure, it's like you can't touch it. You know, they have their own right of way, even though they're going right through your environment, you can't touch them. Even the, you know, the little green space beside the freeway, you can't touch them. So that's a good question. That, that, that's a good um, prompt to this next question around how do you, um, in, in your own words, how do you think your projects really challenge the status quo? Um, and, and on a related note, there was some, some questions around um, just your perspective around the increased investment and the impacts on gentrification, which is a, is a question I'm sure you deal with all the time too. Oh, yeah. um, well, the first question is, you know, I just remember um, an early project we did and someone called me and was like, I really like your project. I like how you turn the benches out towards the sidewalk. And I went, huh, that's an interesting question. And it made me think that, you know, what we were doing or what we do is we try to look at spaces and we then relate to spaces, not just inward, but outward, right? And so these little things I think make the work difference when you respond not in that normative way. And one of our early projects, we got an award for it, it was Lafayette Square, which I was talking about. They said, instead of turning the space inward, we turn the space outward, right? And these are just things that we were trying to give people more spaces, right? Being able to sort of get together and not be one. And I do think this notion of, again, I talked about it early, about homogeneity, right? Making things the same, is kind of stuck. We're kind of stuck in that. It's like all the street trees need to be the same. All the light poles need to be yeah. the same. All the, you know, everything needs to be the same, which does not distinguish anything, right? Other than, you know, in, in, uh, we have a, a thing called Mandela Parkway here. I think it's known for having like over a hundred historic lights. And I'm like, well, why do you have historic lights there? You know, that has nothing to do, right, with the kind of space, but it's really trying to make the same thing everywhere. Right, which again, I don't think is equity at all, right? In a way, it's almost marginalizing space. Yeah, there, um, we're, I, I know we're up for time. It's, um, it's 1030 and there's a ton of great questions. No, there's like 35, 36. Yeah, um, there's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, I'll turn it over to Lily, but there is a, an there's an interesting set of questions of, you know, in this moment, like your, um, your advice for planners, um, and then there's an interesting question about how design can inspire action 
in the public realm when we live in such an individualistic society? And I, I sort of like that question because, you know, we're, we're right now in the midst of, you know, this war about, you know, the individual versus the collective good. And so do you think design can inspire some of that, especially some of that civic engagement that you're asking for in terms of the public realm? Yeah, I think we're seeing it around the, across the country, you know, where we have, you know, neighborhoods um, are taking back their streets. I know in San Francisco, there's a couple of neighborhoods that just basically have said, this is our street. Now this is our living room and they're collectively using it together. I even see it here on my street, you know, now that I'm sheltered, you know, that we all see that we're in this together. It's really, it's harder back at the city level, but at these smaller levels, I do think there are these moments and hopefully as we begin to break out of here, we don't lose that, that there is more advocacy. And I'm hoping that planners actually see, right? That the kinds of things that are happening now that they can keep doing them, right? I'm trying to close my street. I'm working with planners in downtown Oakland and you know, I'm trying to say we can do more of this. And so I do think this action that we're having now hopefully gives us the courage and it also gives us the power to continue to fight for these things that bring us together versus the things that separate us. Yeah, um, th that's, a, that's a really hopeful, um, I like that um, ending. Um, Lily, do you wanna come on in and yeah. close this up? Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to, that was, that was I, I don't want this to end. I don't want this conversation to end. That Questions was, are like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just, I, I think that was a, a wonderful point to, to end on um, around, around calling for courage um, in this moment in time. Um, and and there, are, there are so many questions in there, but I just wanna bubble up a couple of themes. Um, a lot of folks were pushing on engagement, how you're thinking about engagement, um, how do you get everyone around the table. Um, there was a question around leveraging technology um, and then there was a lot of folks were were continuing to, to push around this notion around um, your quote and I think it's brilliant um, I'm looking for the you said you're looking for the double negative um, and examples of that and that, that seemed to really resonate um, with our audience Walter um, so um, so with that um, thank you thank you for taking the time um, and and chatting with with Lillian and me um, no, really I love it. I mean, I think you, you see the double negative being played out with Black Lives Matter painted on streets. You know, I mean, again, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's a negative thing. It's just that things can coexist, right? And the more we kind of think about allowing these things to coexist, those things that are different than maybe even some of our beliefs, but they coexist. They only make us better. Yeah, yeah, and and folks were asking for example, so thank you for for highlighting um, that example, and and I also want to um, put in a link for um, your your new book that's going to be out in November, um, Black Landscapes Matter. You can pre-order it, um, and and I know that that we're all excited um, uh, for that, Walter. And and again, um, thank you, and and for our audience, we'll we will um, see you next week. On, on Tuesday, the same time, same place. Uh, Lillian, do you wanna say a couple of words about, about next week? Yeah, we're wanting to have a discussion around the digital divide. So Walter, we've been going, and, and just for context, we've been going um, back and forth around these issues of the public space, public realm, and also the impact of technology on our lives right now and in the future of our cities. And so the digital divide has been something that's come up constantly. And so finally, we're gonna have a conversation next week with a couple of um, communities that are doing some really interesting work around the country about on this area. Fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks again, Walter. Thank you, see guys. You next, see you next week, Lillian. Bye.